Hi, everyone. For those of you signing in, we're just going to wait a little bit as the as the participants, um, as you all all start to, to sign in. So we'll start in just a minute or so. So for those of you signing on, we're just waiting a, a minute or so as everyone uh, logs into the Zoom meeting. So just hold on a minute or two more. Okay, well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today um, for what we have is a special members webinar on the current preservation projects we've done here at Falling Water as well as uh, future preser preservation work that's in store for us here. Uh, I'm Justin Gunther, the Director of Falling Water and I'm joined by Scott Perkins, who's our Director of Preservation and Collections. And I think hidden on your screen also behind the scenes is Nicole Walsh. Uh, who's on our conservation on the Conservancy's development team, uh, and she'll be fielding questions for us at the end of the webinar. Um, but Scott has a, a great deal to report out on to you today. Um, he's going to cover um, projects that we completed this year. The first one being the bridge over the driveway that connects the main house uh, to the step canopy and onto the guest house. He's also going to talk about the bolsters project. Uh, the bolsters are what support the house's cantilever system. So he'll cover that project, as well as um, a reconstruction of the walls to the car bridge that spans Bear Run. And you'll probably remember some of these projects. We've been talking about them for a while, haven't we, Scott? I think we started most of them before the pandemic started. Um, but oh, as the, yeah, even earlier. And as the pandemic settled in in 2020 um, and Falling Water was forced to close, we had to put these projects on hold and then kind of circle back and just focus on operations uh, and not on large scale preservation projects. Um, but over the past year, since the house has been reopened to the public, these projects have regained momentum. Uh, we were able to start them up again and funded by generous support of our members, people like you uh, from grants, uh, from foundations, and also um, kind of the, the pivotal funding source for this, this whole the projects that Scott's going to talk about, a Keystone Preservation Grant um, from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, as we all know, with Falling Waters Preservation, Scott's just going to talk about three projects, but the work never ends here. So I'm going to tell you after Scott finishes up, I'll tell you about what's next in terms of preservation. So before I turn it over to you, Scott, just a couple of housekeeping things for our participants that are joining us uh, online. Um, if you do have questions uh, as we go through the presentations, if you'll use the Q&A function, that should be located in the middle of your screen at the bottom of the images. You'll see a little thought bubble with a Q&A under it. So you can click on that and then type in your questions there. And then at the end, we should have about 10 minutes left um, where Nicole will um, help us field those questions for you. Um, so Scott, we're excited to, to share um, uh, the preservation work that we've accomplished. And again, thanks to all of you for all of your support in making this great work happen. So Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, got some good things to show you. Work that we've been doing um, over the past year, as Justin said. Um, today, I'll just talk about uh, three recent preservation projects each of which uh, provided us with some challenges. So I'll discuss some of those. And uh, more importantly, provided us opportunities to not only learn more about falling waters materials and um, construction methods, but also get a little bit into the, the head of Frank Lloyd Wright as he was designing things to, um, 
really kind of understand his rationale for, for his specifications for the building. Um, the first project I was gonna address today is um, a repair that we made to the enclosed bridge that spans the drive. And this was a, a repair to address water infiltration um, in that bridge. In the winter of 2019, we worked on the interior of the project of the bridge. I won't talk about that with this project, um, but beginning in January of 2020, um, we did sort of phase two of it, which was to address the rooftop terrace um, and um, using a similar um, method of, of a new sort of roofing and water membrane system. It also gave us the opportunity to use it as a test case for work that we'll be doing in the future. Um, this is just a photograph to orient you to the space. Um, I'm talking about the bridge over here. If you can see my pointer um, that connects the main house, which was built in 1937 and um, leads um, to the canopy steps that go up to the guest house. And that bridge is a technically part of the guest house. Um, project, which was finished in 1939. Um, what's also great about our archives is we, we have access to a lot of historic images. And this is one showing um, the construction of the house around 1936. And you can see the north elevation. <clears throat> of course, the canopy and the uh, bridge are not in place yet. But Wright's original intention was to have um, the connection point between the two structures be on the third floor level. If you're familiar with the inside of the house from a tour, um, that's uh, currently where the bed uh, in Edgar Jr.'s um, sleeping alcove is located. Um, but eventually and ultimately it was um, located on the second floor and um, a hole was sort of punched through this uh, north elevation um, to connect the bridge. And the bridge was a really kind of a, um, a reinforced concrete tube. Uh, for you to walk through. And it was um, cantilevered and suspended from a stone pier um, on the hillside, and then um, just sort of set in place, uh, embraced uh, within the wall that it punctured on the north side of the main house. So um, in January of 2020, then, um, we uh, started working on this uh, rooftop terrace and installed a um, enclosure there to allow our roofers to be able to work um, throughout the winter. We heated it, we electrified it, um, tried to keep it as low um, impact visually as we could um, and still you know, have to keep it waterproofed and, um, and all of that. Um, another orientation point here for you is the inside of this bridge. If you've been on the tour, um, you know, this is the room that has our wonderful Diego Rivera painting. Um, but I wanted to show you this in particular because of that stone pier. This is the cantilever point for that bridge, but also the skylights that run along the ceiling. Um, that's, of course, where the water started um, coming into the space. And um, the second phase then to work on the roof was also to kind of address the replacement of those, um, those skylights. Um, here's a nice shot of what the inside of that enclosure looked like. Um, you can see the wall there of the main house uh, at the third floor level. So you're standing on the roof of this. Um, I also want to just sort of point out the, um, the sort of skylights, the condition of the skylights um, in 2020, and also the sort of collars um, that go around the glass. Um, this is going to be one of our challenges that we're um, working with with this rooftop. Um, the second big challenge for us was uh, when we removed the flagstone to do the work, um, a small little dog leg section of this bridge, which I, I'm showing here in a red box, um, we discovered that there was no concrete there. It was just sort of um, sand fill. Um, so we had to um, then work to put down a vapor barrier, pour a concrete slab, um, allow time for that slab to cure, and then of course make sure that everything was sloped outward towards the, um, the drains that were existing. You can see a little um, opening here at the top where one of those drains goes through the stone wall to the driveway below. Um, in the plan view then you can see all of the stones numbered, which is great. We always do that so we know where they go back into place. And then the five openings here in blue um, mark the location of the uh, skylights. Um, but the condition of the skylights, um, it became very apparent that it was in poor condition when we started removing the roofing material, which is all of this kind of um, cracked um, material, shards of 
of um, dried roofing material that was removed. Um, it showed us too that these skylights were essentially framed in wood, which had rotted and deteriorated. Um, so again, another moment to sort of stop and do some investigation, take lots of photographs, lots of notes. Um, this would be looking down um, onto that skylight. There's a white uh, board that's covering it up on the interior so that we're not dropping any debris into the inside of the room. Uh, and another close up then of this um, same skylight once we re removed it um, to show you how the water kind of traveled through this space. Um, it's uh, showing a lot of, um, you know, degraded concrete, but also corroded reinforcing bar. And so we had to really address um, those materials before we did any kind of patching and repairing on it. Um, this was all happening in, in February. Um, we had then a lag in the summer uh, due to some, um, you know, issues with the pandemic and being able to work on the site. So it wasn't until August that we were able to fabricate a mock-up of the skylight um, that we're showing you here on the left um, with a um, sort of a, a basic um, system set up of what the roofing would look like. So it's a flashing, liquid flashing applied over uh, the roof, which is an, um, a different material than we, we took off the roof. Uh, and one that um, we hope will um, help prevent any water leaks in the future. Uh, and in order to do that, we um, conducted a water test on the sample. So we set up a hose uh, in the parking area there of our maintenance shop, ran water on it for two hours and saw no um, moisture coming through on the other side. So that was perfect, it was great. We went ahead and fabricated um, the whole um, lot of them, uh, replacing that wood framing system with copper again, to help with water and uh, not having anything kind of brought away. Um, and the collars that I mentioned in the earlier photograph um, raised up about an inch from the, the top of the flagstone. And these look um, very high, they're probably about five inches or so. Um, but um, all of that um, height will be made up with the roofing membrane and um, with the sand layer and the flagstone. And eventually they will be flush to the level of the flagstone. So I'm showing you a couple uh, views here of those layers being put in place by our roofers. Um, we also addressed some drainage. So we installed um, replacements to some copper pipe drains that were already there. Um, in the photograph on the right then we, um, this is just a, a mock-up, but we inserted um, a metal drain um, that was going through the mortar joint of a stone wall just to kind of help the water from um, further deteriorating any of those mortar joints on the capstones. And then here you see just photographs of those two copper drains in place. Um, the flanges of these drains then will be um, flashed over with the roofing membrane to seal everything down. So it'll be a nice tight um, seal there for the water. And then the way that the material is laid will direct all the water towards these drains. So we should not have any um, standing water or pooling water on the terrace anymore. Um, the material goes down in two directions, so east-west and then north-south, and that keeps it nice. Um, all those seams are, are tight and we do some overlapping with them as well. Um, but you can see the height of those skylights being slowly um, um, lessened and lessened as the, as the material gets built up. So we're looking at the right here pretty close to um, being able to put the flagstone in. And then a second water test uh, that we conducted before we put any stone down um, was to, um, for 48 hours, flood the roof and um, leave the water stand there for 48 hours to see what would happen. And again, successful test, no water on the inside. And so we proceeded to relay the stone and um, repoint the floor. So um, what it looks like now, just recently, this photo was taken last month, um, the new drain uh, is there to help strain away um, debris, but then also um, the next step that we're working on, even today, the roofers are here um, installing um, lead flashing where you see that roofing material kind of scoop up under the stone. Uh, and then we've um, also started lifting the capstones. This is that dog leg section of the roof there. Um, lifting those capstones so that the flashing can go entirely beneath them and keep any moisture at all from traveling 
um, within those mortgage lines. Um, it's an interesting thing with this stone in particular because it, we're guessing it's probably about a 600 pound stone, um, but these were all installed in 1939. And this stone was obviously put in place before the rest of the canopy steps go up. So one of the things we kind of learned was um, this probably hasn't been moved since 1939. And uh, we can't even get it to turn the corner to um, go out onto the canopy to store it while we're working. So we've got it on a on a, a little skid there that we can roll around and move it out of the way when we need to. But um, things like that are you know sort of challenging in one sense, but also very interesting in how um, this house was really put together uh, in the 1930s. Um, the second uh, project I'm going to talk about is um, the first of a two-phase project, and this is the project Justin had talked about being funded by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Um, it's also close to completion, uh, both of these are, and um, initially we saw uh, the Bolster project and the Bridge project as two separate projects and combined them into one um, Keystone Historic Preservation Grant that the PHMC gives out every year. Um, primarily to streamline them both, we saw that the materials were very similar. We wanted to streamline the labor, but then also um, really kind of best utilize our, our financial resources for any materials um, and the contracting labor that came up. So the first one I'll talk about is then on the bolsters, which was a project to repair cracks along the surface of those um, supports beneath the living room cantilever. And I'll show you um, a drawing. This is the presentation drawing of Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. And you can see those bolsters underneath the cantilever here. They've got, at this point in time, kind of a, a stepped kind of almost art deco um, detail on them, which, which doesn't um, become realized. Um, but you see how they um, come out here. There's one stone pier on the end, and then the um, the concrete bolsters were all poured and um, reinforced and formed in place um, before the cantilever then uh, gets put on top for the living room. And again, looking at historic photos, they give us a lot of information uh, about this um, process. And this one shows um, that stone pier that I pointed out, um, the bolsters in place here with, with um, lumber around them that was probably used for the framing, um, construction workers walking all over the place on top of that waterfall. So it's a great image, um, but gives us a lot of information about, um, about them. If you look closely, you can see thin bars kind of coming out the top of, of these bolsters, and that's the um, steel reinforcing bars that were then connected um, when the um, cantilever was poured. Another historic image is um, a little bit further in the construction phase. Um, this shows that cantilever um, completed, uh, and you can see there's still um, you know, steel sticking out from those forms. But this is the opening of the, um, the hatch that uh, eventually will lead um, down to the stream, those stairs that are um, a wonderful feature of the living room. And you can see here the three pier, the three bolsters, um, each resting on a stone um, footing, um, which sets right into the water. And so that's an issue that we're dealing with with this project as well is um, repairing any um, lost mortar to those footings. Um, but I wanted to show this photo in particular because it shows this cold joint uh, between the bolster and the um, slab above. And that's where these cracks are starting to appear at these places on the wall where um, two materials were poured at different times and so have different um, properties and, and the cracks start opening up. Um, a really great view of, of the space between the bolsters. Um, this shows you um, the boulder, um, you know, the, this is really the connection of falling water to nature and it's very sort of emblematic of, of Wright's, um, you know, idea that the house is seemingly coming up from nature. Um, we are um, working on, you know, the uh, concrete bolsters um, that you see on the side, the vertical walls, and then also on the soffit, which is the horizontal piece that goes across the ceiling. Um, you can see some patching from previous um, repairs up there as well. Um, but this project really started in, um, late 2013 with the monitoring of some horizontal cracks that had started appearing. And this is again, that area, that cold joint 
between the bolsters and the, um, the slab. So uh, we applied digital monitoring system with the advice of an architect and engineer. And um, these were epoxy um, meters that were installed and um, gave us digital readings for well over a year, um, almost second by second. And the good thing was they didn't really fluctuate. Um, I think the, the widest fluctuation was one one hundredth of an inch. So um, we monitored them in this way. You can see uh, visually not so good. There's lots of cabling. Um, these cables all then wound to a, um, a sort of um, digital you know, receptor in the uh, basement of the house. So we had some um, camouflaging that we needed to do to um, to deal with that, but it was great. It gave us a lot of information. The fact that these were not uh, um, structural cracks that we had to worry about, um, really just um, kind of surface things. Um, in 2015, then we removed those digital meters and removed kind of that visual, um, you know, static from the from the house. Um, John Matteo, our structural engineer, um, is seen here applying kind of a low tech version that he designed, which was just threaded rod drilled into the walls. Um, and each of those rods then had a little dimple in it that it could um, uh, be used to receive uh, calipers. So John's here installing um, installing those rods. Um, it was left then up to us, our team here at Falling Water, to go down monthly um, for a period and then quarterly, semi-annually, and then annually to go down and take readings. Um, and again, showing no movement, um, showing a little bit more of um, here the detail you can see the the residue of those epoxy mounted um, meters and then also just kind of a close-up here of the, the concrete texture on the walls. In 2017 we we did some non-destructive testing which was really just to remove the coating on um, one of the bolsters to get an understanding of how deep it was, which it wasn't really, it was just a very skim coat of stucco and then the paint coating. So you see a section here of, of the concrete um, revealed, um, some cracks that had been repaired. You can see the patching above and below that, really just kind of a cover up with um, you know, a paint and then um, a little bit more of the ceiling repairs that have been done um, in that time as well. So um, this is the typical kind of condition and it was in 2017 and 18 when we um, started looking at this project as being one that we wanted to apply for a grant from PHMC for. Um, our engineer then, John, um, put together a proposal and a set of drawings. Um, his proposal for, um, for handling these cracks was really to cover them with a flexible um, mesh, and um, it was um, it is a project or product rather that um, is kind of innovative. Um, it's a um, PBO, and I'm, I, I have it spelled out, but I'm not going to pronounce it. Um, but it's a synthetic mesh; it's a woven material, um, but it's not anything made with um, carbon or um, any kind of um, epoxy is used on it and it's got some flexibility to it and it's applied almost like wallpaper. So you can see here on his drawing these bands of green um, applied vertically and horizontally on one of the bolster walls um, with cracks where they would be covering the cracks then. Um, we uh, Once we received the grant from PHMC then we went around the bidding process and um, um, found a contractor to come and do the work for us. And, and so this project and the bridge project I'll talk about next were almost done concurrently. They were um, crews that um, worked separately, but from the same company. Um, some worked during the night, some worked during the day. Um, we utilized our Wednesdays here when there are no visitors on site to um, do some of the work that's loud uh, or involved a lot of um, the equipment moving. Um, but the first step for these bolsters was to kind of um, incise on the bolster walls um, this grid that was um, designed to have the, the mesh installed. So you can see here um, grinding away. We were looking really just in about an eighth of an inch depth, um, so pretty uh, minimal. Um, and then here's just a, a sort of a process photo. This is that same test patch that I showed you from 2017, um, now opened up a little bit more. Um, 
and then showing you how those bands will kind of fit across the wall. Um, the crews there are working, they then kind of smooth everything out and grind it. Um, what's great is that we're not um, removing any material that doesn't um, that doesn't need to be removed. So following that kind of preservation rule of leave it alone unless um, it needs to go away. But um, a good photo here showing um, that view under the house, uh, its orientation to those stairs going down to the stream, and then the crew um, there working um, during the day in this case, but also at night. So um, some of this work was of course very loud um, we worried about vibrations in the house and that sort of thing. So um, the crew did come in at night and do some overnight work. Um, here you can see the gray concrete where the coating and the stucco had been removed, um, leaving the area then that will be covered by this fiber reinforcing mesh. We also had to fill those cracks. And in this case, we did use an epoxy. Um, so these were um, little spots or almost like uh, little straw heads that were injected into the, or placed into the cracks. And then the um, epoxy crack fill was then squeezed in um, to them. Uh, once that all cured and dried, it was ground down to be the same surface as the, um, the concrete and um, it was a nice close up. And then the um, installation of that fiber mesh could begin. So this is a, another crew coming in um, who specialized in this reinforcement. It's an interesting project or uh, product from Italy, only about 20 years old. And um, the more we kind of learned about it, the more it was really you know, a, a wonderful thing for us. It's flexible in the sense that um, it kind of moves with the, with the temperature and the humidity fluctuations under the house. Um, it's easy to use. Um, all of it is um, kind of embedded in its own mortar. So it's a, a layer of mortar uh, with a layer of mesh with a layer of mortar with a layer of mesh with a layer of mortar. So within that kind of eighth inch um, depth, um, we can quite a bit of material in there and um, all washes up with water. So there's not a lot of chemical um, impact happening either under there. And then I show you a photo of um, what that mesh looks like and a little bit of kind of the mortar mix. So you can get a sense of, of really the true nature of this um, reinforcing. And this is not a, a metal product, like I said, um, but um, it's just really great and kind of flexible, almost like a, like a drapery fabric. Um, the bridge over Bear Run then is part two. And this is, like I said, concurrent to the, um, what's happening under the, the bolsters. Um, this is a project that we had been looking at um, for quite a, a bit of time as well. Um, the last major repair to the bridge was done in 2009. And um, we had started um, seeing a lot of spalling or falling concrete um, from it and patching as we could, but then suddenly realizing that we're kind of patching patch material instead of really um, dealing with the problem of, of moisture getting inside of the concrete. Um, I bring this drawing back again because I want to show you too, Wright's got this bridge in mind. Um, there was an existing bridge here that spanned Bear Run um, previous to um, the Kaufmans owning the land. And so Wright's got a design here for a bridge with um, some kind of stone um, abutments at the corner um, that connects to the house. So it's all kind of integral, same materials. Um, and um, then again, looking at historic photos from the Falling Water Archives, um, you can get a sense of what this bridge looks like. Um, we had a great intern this summer who really looked closely at these and realized that in fact, the bridge that we had just demolished was um, likely the second bridge there. The bridge on the left, if you notice in this photograph has a sort of a flared bottom um, as it goes down to the deck and the bridge in the photograph taken by Hedrick Blessing um, that same year, that's all kind of sharp and um, very perpendicular to the deck. So uh, we found some correspondence um, between the apprentice that was here on site and Wright explaining that the wall had to be knocked down, but they could um, salvage the reinforcing bars inside of it. And so it was um, a wall that was rebuilt, but you see how um, it sort of mimics the different um, edge treatments and corners of the, um, the, the parapets of the terraces. 
And then two more photographs, just kind of different views, but showing you then how the bridge um, connects to those um, stone abutments, um, dry riverbed here on the left, and you know the stair going up the hillside, which will be um, removed um, when the guest house is added in 1939. Um, then in 2017, uh, we uh, took a good hard look at this, and this was um, a photograph here showing you kind of the condition and what was really happening to the, the bottom edge of the bridge, which was um, that concrete was falling away, either because of freeze thaw um, or kind of just poor um, kind of a connection to the, um, to the existing material. Um, the um, Concrete underneath, you start seeing around then the corner, you can see it's probably about a quarter inch thick or so, this stucco um, just started coming off. You, you could put your hands on it and, and stuff would come off, but you can see a little bit closer here, um, some of the um, corrosion and the rust coming through from the reinforcing bars underneath that concrete. So kind of concerned about all of that as we um, went forward. And then a close up here of, of the many patches on top of patches uh, that we also felt were contributing to the, to the decay um, of the concrete. Again, not structural issues. There was no issue with this ever, you know, the entire thing ever falling down. It was just the, the stucco coat that was not um, performing. Um, our engineer uh, had thought initially about um, um, installing uh, what's called a cathodic protection system, which kind of is kind of a low, uh, low voltage um, system that attaches to the rebar and, and electric current is brought through it to kind of help with um, preventing any more um, corrosion. And um, we brought a, a subcontractor here on site, a specialist uh, in that field, uh, and again, kind of felt uh, the concrete was too far gone. That was all confirmed after doing core samples, which we did um, later in that summer um, and showed that just um, the concrete, there had been so much um, kind of chemical change to it that um, it was better off to just replace the two parapets. The, the horizontal deck of the bridge that you see above there was um, replaced in 1969, I believe. So that is not part of this project. We were not looking to replace um, that. Uh, it was really just the vertical walls which you can see here extend beneath the deck about two feet. Uh, so this project was, was a big one uh, for us. It involved a lot of logistics. Um, we had to um, think about scaffolding. Um, the crew needed to work um, above the water surface. We had to worry about um, high uh, rising water, um, fast water, um, changes that would happen sometimes um, within 24 hours. Um, we also have um, an exceptional value stream in Bear Run. So um, placing um, footings of scaffolding into the water was not ideal. Um, so uh, our engineer, uh, working with the contractor's engineer, developed a scaffolding system, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, speaking of logistics, this is one area where we really had to kind of think and almost walk out the, the entire process. Um, these large beams that you see are the scaffolding that will span the stream. And they came, like you see on a truck, um, getting them um, down to the site uh, was fine, but only to a certain point. So everything had to be offloaded onto a small little skid truck uh, and brought down um, one by one or two by two to the area. Um, and then um, wait until night and kind of set everything in place. Um, these, these, they almost look like little earrings or I would say like Christmas tree ornament hangers um, were installed on the bridge. And then each of those beams was lowered down uh, and hung from them. Um, these would be the cross beams then that go underneath the bridge and the large ones that you saw then are put into place um, running north south on top and then all of that is kind of locked in with with threaded rod but um, it's very dramatic and very um, uh, sculptural almost uh, but it's um, 
it, it provided us uh, the ability to still have the bridge open uh, for visitors, which is an important part, stopping point on the, on the tours for us. Um, and um, having them be perforated also helped. You could still kind of see through the beams. Um, it was a little bit tall, but it was still tall enough that you could take photographs over it. And um, just kind of an interesting um, uh, solution, I think, to the typical, um, you know, poles um, scaffolding there. But you can see then, um, once it's all kind of locked into place, you have the ability to put platforms on. And so this was one area, uh, or one view here showing you the areas, the walls being um, demolished. Um, it allowed the crew to kind of work down, um, you know, at the level of the, the wall, so they're not reaching over the wall or reaching up, uh, and then safely, you know, capture any debris that's falling so nothing was going into the stream. And then a view I took here of the East Terrace shows you um, what that looks like for the visitor um, standing on the, the East Terrace, looking at the bridge. Um, it almost, you know, started, it really started kind of um, corroding itself over the summer, um, but uh, it very low impact, I think, um, considering what it was doing for us. Um, so the demolition happened again, like I said, on Wednesdays, uh, and um, this was one day when they decided they would tackle the, um, the demolition of one of the parapets. This is the westernmost parapet um, using, um, you know, jackhammer, hand tools. Um, you can see crumbling um, concrete there at the bottom. Uh, and then another point of, of kind of discovery for us, too, or at least confirmation was that this concrete was constructed in such a way that it was using smooth river rock and um, not jagged aggregates. So um, it, uh, you know, easily came apart and you can see it almost kind of crumbled into, um, you know, small pieces there. Um, another kind of dramatic photo showing the wall coming down and then you see the reinforcing bars inside there very far apart. Um, and again, you know, it's all kind of interesting for us to, to know about the building, things that don't show up on drawings. Uh, and then with that whole parapet removed, you can see it just becomes even a more interesting um, view across the bridge. Um, we don't have barricades up yet. This is a, obviously a day when we don't have visitors on site, but um, we did install them um, partially to help um, the crew that was working there be able to work safely, uh, keep the visitors uh, being able to um, access the bridge and cross the bridge and still get an understanding of what was going on. And we had a great uh, interpretation plan um, with our educators so that things were explained. Um, and uh, I think it was very interesting for them as well as, as all of our visitors to know what we were doing and that we're able to keep open um, while all of this work is being done. And there you see just even in the rain, uh, they're out there working, but this was, um, it was great. There's a tour here stopped on the bridge talking about um, scaffolding and what's happening on the other side of this wall. And what is happening on the other side of the wall is a lot of um, um, kind of removal of the rebar, uh, a lot of cleaning up of the debris and then getting prepared then to start the forms and setting up a new whole um, um, reinforcing system for them. Um, we we elected to use stainless steel uh, reinforcing for this project. So that involved um, custom um, formed pieces for the bridge, um, all tied together with stainless steel wire, um, completely um, um, new system from what was there originally. And you can see here compared to the photo we saw a few images ago, um, the reinforcing bar is then placed much closer together. Um, special pieces that were curved um, allowed those um, those rounded edges of the parapet to happen as well. And then another photo here showing how it extends below the deck of the bridge. And one more shot there, kind of all installing. We also had the abutments. Uh, there were four, one in each corner of the bridge and the concrete um, continued into them. Um, the stone was, was cut and formed around them, but we had to remove the concrete and not the stone, um, which was a little bit of a challenge. But again, you see on the left, one of those um, openings there with the original rebar and then how we solved the problem of um, putting it into um, to a cleaned out um, void there in the abutment with the new rebar. 
and just again, kind of two other shots showing uh, the removal of all of that concrete from within the stone above them. The forms coming up, these are just um, short walls that are, are, are all sort of tensioned together, um, allowing the channel um, there to remain open so that concrete can be poured on top. Uh, the concrete came in on a couple of trucks um, overnight, and um, this was a very early morning, but um, again, you can see how um, the challenge of getting even concrete delivered to this um, job site was um, solved. Um, everything was brought in and um, brought directly to the site rather than having to worry about having a truck come too close to the house or to the bridge. Um, and then um, all poured in place, allowed to cure, and then slowly could be sculpted, um, at least preliminarily, um, to form those rounded edges of the parapets. And you can see how all of that formwork is all um, connected. And then once they're removed, um, we allowed them to cure for a couple of weeks, um, cleaned up the job site there, but you can see then that new um, edge to the, um, to the wall there where it goes inside of the abutment. And then uh, last uh, for this project was to apply a stucco coat. So this is a finished coat of, of um, concrete that's applied to the walls. Um, the only thing left to do for us now is to paint them, which will happen in the spring uh, when our weather gets a little bit warmer. Um, and there's a nice kind of shot there too, those nice crisp kind of pointed minded corners. Uh, the last thing I wanted to, to talk about, which will kind of lead into Justin's um, talk, is um, just kind of a short um, update on a project uh, that we began in 2016 to um, create a, a BIM model or a building uh, information model um, using digital um, um, photography. And so um, our preservation architect, Architectural Preservation Studios, came to um, scanned the exterior of the building in um, one visit in the end of uh, 2016, and then the following um, winter came back to do the interiors. And this is Douglas Emilia, who's one of the partners at APS. And he um, was able to do all of this work on the exterior while we were open for the season. Um, but of course, then on the right, um, we waited till we were closed for winter. Um, so he could move around the house and take the images there kind of um, without being in anybody's way. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting system. It's kind of an orbital camera about the size of a, a toaster um, that captures um, photographic images. And you can see there were targets placed on the house. These are all used then to connect um, all, of, all of the digital images once they're loaded up into the, the computer and create a model. Um, on the interior then these kind of mirror balls were placed around the, um, the house and again serving the same purpose where they could be um, connected, almost connecting the dots um, to create a, a three-dimensional view of the room. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a low res image, but it gives you a sense of how um, once you put all these photographs together, how everything kind of um, creates this 3D model. And um, we, we found that you could, you could really kind of slice through the house in any direction, um, almost down to an inch, if not a, a half inch. Um, and it sort of gives us interesting views of the house and um, shows us voids. Um, we could get the true accurate thickness of say the guest house swimming pool wall and uh, be able to create a form if we ever had to make it um, using this, this information. Um, here's just a typical floor plan, again, kind of low resolution, but you see all the millions of, of little pixelated dots that come together to create uh, one of these 3D images. Uh, and then we, we took it a step further because we were kind of thinking about using this in different ways. It was great to sort of capture the house at a point in time, but we wanted to be able to use it as um, almost a digital file cabinet, as we were calling it, uh, where we could attach historic photographs or documents or conservation records um, to um, spots on the house or particular pieces of furniture. And so we brought in an animation firm from Oklahoma City to help um, take this point cloud data and create 
um, a model and essentially a kind of a virtual reality um, um, system here. They call it Remap. It's one of their proprietary software, but they um, took this and as you can see here, they've created a, a three dimensional version of falling water minus the landscape. Um, but they also kind of uh, took uh, one room in particular, which is the master bedroom and um, created a, um, uh, a way to look at the different objects in the room to um, create this file cabinet. So here you just see a standard photograph of the room. Um, that same camera just can take photographs like any camera. Um, once you pixelate it then and start putting it into point cloud, you see all the, the various little dots that comprise that photograph. And then once you start connecting them, you have this kind of mesh or web <laughs> that's again kind of creating the um, the digital room, but then also showing us that even what we think of as a flat surface really isn't flat. There's all sorts of angles and and facets to the to the furniture and the walls and the ceiling in the room. Uh, and then finally, once you start entering in some of the visual effects and the lighting, you have this digital space that can be moved through. Um, we can't move things in it or um, open doors and things, but this is really just kind of to give us a, a, a shell or an architectural space then to start working. So our first, um, first kind of move towards this was to think about specific objects and um, what we would want to, um, the types of documents and, and things that we would want to include in this model. Um, for instance, this photograph or this painting rather of um, Edgar Kaufman from Victor Hammer in the living room, um, we could attach uh, a historic photograph like the one in the bottom left here where the photo is not on the wall um, yet. And uh, even a conservation image like the one on the right showing the painting being cleaned um, just a few years ago. So it could be a you know, series of photographs, of uh, written reports, of uh, video, um, and then the, the output is really much like a um, virtual tour where you have information that's pulled from our collections database, um, an orientation map um, showing you the, the room that you're in and the direction that you're facing, and then small little kind of thumbnails here um, along the bottom that you can expand. We can constantly add them or change them. Uh, as we go. So this is something that's in progress on the collection side, but also opens up um, the potential for using it to record all of our maintenance and preservation um, projects going on in the house um, from here back into time and doing the same sort of thing, inserting some of these historic photographs I've showed you, but then also photographs of all the work that's been done on a particular room or um, part of the building. Um, Architectural Preservation Studio that, that initially took these laser images for us um, also wanted to use them in a new way, which was to be um, sort of thought of as part of uh, a preservation kind of document. And so we um, contracted with them in 2019 to update the preservation plan uh, that they created for us uh, in 2009. Nope, in 1999, 20 years later. So uh, since that, of course, we've had building materials that have um, expired warranties. There's things that are new as far as technology and, and uh, methods that um, we could use. And so um, we took this preservation plan update then and used it as the basis um, for a grant that we've applied for with um, the Commonwealth that Justin will tell you about shortly. Um, Pamela Jerome, our architect is shown in the photograph on the right with John Matteo, our structural engineer. Um, both of these folks have um, great institutional history with us um, going back to uh, the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, and so they worked together on this proposal, which is well over 350 pages of the specifications for um, project that will then lead us hopefully um, into the next 20 years. Um, they came out uh, in April and did a, a visual survey of current conditions. You see photos here of the staff there, um, taking images, taking notes, um, and combining it into um, sort of a, a large document of all the um, conditions of the house. But those laser scans that Douglas did for us back in 2016 and 2017 um, were then um, transferred into AutoCAD. And um, they did this very quickly. It took about two weeks to do. 
And um, we brought in um, the Arts Graphique et Patrimon, which is uh, the firm in Paris that, um, if you remember a, a couple of years ago when the fire at the Notre Dame happened, um, they did a, a virtual reconstruction of it. And this was the firm that took um, historic photographs and recent photographs, laser scans of Notre Dame to create um, a virtual model. So uh, they, uh, Put this into an AutoCAD system. Um, here you see a dimension to plan overlaid with uh, a site plan of the house with the this car bridge we've been working on um, and then the main house here with the um, the bridge that I showed you in our first project um, leading up to the guest house um, but also great interesting views of um, they're almost like film negatives um, taken through the house or x-rays and this is one um, looking um, west, you see the, here the opening of the fireplace in the living room. Um, and then on the reverse side of that, looking from the kitchen, here's the back of that opening in the fireplace. So you're able to kind of see through the house in inter interesting ways. And of course, in ways that Franklin Wright probably couldn't have thought of. Um, and this is the last image I'll leave you with, but this is a sort of a top to bottom section um, from the top of the chimney down to um, these footings and the bolsters under the house. So you can really get a sense of the intricacy of what those laser scan images can do. Um, we can get down to a 16th of an inch if we wanna measure every mortar joint. And um, so this is where we're going next. And I will hand it back to you, Justin. All right, thanks, Scott. Appreciate that. Very, it's fascinating to see the level of intricacy of these new drawings, uh, which I think will, I mean, they're as artistic as they are documentary and uh, there will be a wonderful resource for us as we move forward. Um, and you know, the projects that Scott mentioned were years in the making. Scott, I mean, from 2014 to present, basically, mm -hmm. from planning to completion for these projects. Um, and again, a huge thanks to um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for their matching grant, the Keystone Historic Preservation Grant, and also uh, to a private donor who made uh, kind of a pivotal closing gap uh, to meet that match for that grant. So we were able to complete those projects uh, this year for the most part. Um, and that brings me to talk to you about what's next for Falling Waters Preservation, because as we know, it never ends. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, And you know, a primary reason for uh, the successful inscription of Falling Water to the UNESCO World Heritage List um, is our ongoing commitment to preservation. Um, and as you can see from Scott's presentation, we, we pride ourselves on, on trying to use the highest of standards in professional practice for historic preservation. So every repair that we make uh, is undertaken with the goal of maintaining the building's integrity so that it can authentically express its significance, which now as a recognized UNESCO World Heritage Site um, has international significance and outstanding universal value. So when we were inscribed in 2019 to the list, we made the decision then to celebrate and honor that designation, um, recognizing that international significance and that outstanding universal value by taking a careful look um, at what's in store for preservation uh, for the building long term, ensuring that falling water would uh, obviously last to the next generations um, and to a growing international community because of that significance, ensuring its long term preservation well into the future. So as Scott mentioned, we reached out to Pamela Jerome and her firm Architectural Preservation Studio over the past two years. They've been assessing and documenting the structure, creating that beautiful drawing set. Um, and adding on to the 99 uh, preservation plan, updating it uh, in 2019 for the next 20 years uh, of planning for preservation here at the site. Um, so what does that mean and what did they find out? And, and I love this um, cartoon by David McCulley. Um, really wasn't a surprise uh, to us that Falling Water is constantly battling the very element that inspired it, which is water. Um, and here you can see falling water consumed by its inspiration and its arch nemesis. Uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright down in the lower uh, right corner, shrugging it all off and 
basically saying, well, that's what happens when you leave art out in the rain. Um, but it was no surprise to us to, to understand that we needed to address the major building systems, the reinforced concrete, the stone masonry, the waterproofing of the roofs and terraces, and the steel of the window and door sashes. Um, and you know, 20 years have gone by since the first preservation master plan. We now have a new one that will guide us into the future. But just like your own house, you know, things that you addressed 20 years ago start to fail. You have to repaint your wood siding every seven years. You have to replace your roof every 20 years. So things that were put in place as part of that 1999 preservation plan have reached their useful life uh, and they're due for updates and replacements now. So in 2019, after inscription, um, we began a first phase of a campaign to get Falling Water World Heritage ready, to ready it for an international, for the international scene and for discerning international visitors. So we entitled a campaign called World Heritage Preserved to address the preservation of these major building systems. Um, and we kind of rode the wave of our new World Heritage inscription in 2019. Uh, and we got a wonderful response to the campaign from our friends of Falling Water and from private foundations. Um, and then of course in 2020, the pandemic hit and took the wind out of the sails of not only our World Heritage Preserve campaign, but out of our World Heritage inscription um, and the celebrations that we had in store all throughout 2020 for this new designation. Um, so instead of celebrating World Heritage, we had to focus on just the generalities of operations and keeping the site going during the pandemic. But we're slowly getting things back to normal. Uh, as Scott mentioned to you, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, awarded us a million dollar matching grant through the Redevelopment Assistance Capital Program. Um, our friends of Falling Water have really uh, stepped up with contributions. Uh, private foundations have contributed as well. Um, so to that three million goal uh, of work that we need to undertake, we're just a couple hundred thousand short of that three three million dollar goal. Um, so we're hoping to close that gap in fundraising <clears throat> and hope to begin these projects at some point next year. And I just wanted to quickly go through what those projects entail. Again, it's the major, major building systems of falling water. Uh, and the first being the stone masonry. Uh, and as Scott mentioned, we have these wonderful archival photos that show the construction. So you're seeing the second floor of falling water rise up uh, in 1937. And if you look at the stone masonry, I'm, I hope you can see my cursor kind of circling a portion of the uh, stone wall is traditional stone masonry. And what that means is you lay up two courses of stone to make the inside and outside of the wall. And then there's a gap in the middle of that inside and outside coursing that you fill with rubble. And what we've learned is that rubble fill on the inside of the walls causes some problems with the natural environment of falling water because the stone was laid up to mimic how it looks uh, in the natural stone striations found in the landscape. Um, so right, um, laid certain stones far true from the surface of the wall. And what that does is creates little shells for, for water to sit on, for snow to rest on. Um, and as the seasons expand and contract uh, the stone masonry with temperature changes, we get hairline cracks in the mortar joints. Um, and that water that pools on the stone then finds its way through the mortar joints, through those hairline cracks, finds its way into that void uh, inside the wall that's rubble filled. And then the water finds its way down through the voids within the masonry. And unfortunately, often to the inside of the house through ceilings dripping down onto the floors. Um, and we do have a pretty constant regime of repointing, but again, seasonal expansion and contraction continues to cause hairline cracking in the masonry. And if you have a, a observant eye, if you walk through falling water on tour, you can often see that we have to roll up paper towels and stick them between the stones along certain mortar joints where the water continues to kind of find its way inside through the stone walls. And we use those paper towels to absorb that moisture that's finding its way in. Um, but during the recent assessment uh, that Pamela Jerome and her team conducted here at Falling Water, we find that one of our main culprits for this water infiltration is the stone chimney mass. So again, this stone chimney mass has two 
uh, exterior solid walls of stone, but then it's filled with rubble on the inside. So water finds its way through hairline cracks in these mortar joints into the voids of the rubble that fill the wall, and then it exits its way out on the inside of the house. Um, and our main problem area is on the third floor. So I'm showing you here uh, the passageway between Edgar Kaufman Jr.'s study and then the light-filled um, gallery on the third floor. And this space of the ceiling is notorious for roof leaks, for water finding its way in. Um, so the plan actually is to inject um, liquid grout into the masonry tower. That liquid grout will fill all the voids of the rubble inside of the tower and essentially close up every opportunity for water to infiltrate through hairline cracks and find its way inside. Um, so that approach uh, will be used on the stone masonry tower of the chimney mass, as well as uh, stone walls at the guest house uh, and on the backside of the main house. The reinforced concrete, um, which you saw some repairs to the bolsters underneath the house, Again, and, and the replacement of the stone wall, uh, replacement of the concrete walls to the bridge over Bear Run um, is, has constantly been an issue uh, here at Falling Water because the aggregate was round river rock. It was oversized. Um, a lot of the walls don't have sufficient reinforcing steel um, and Wright's desire not to include expansion and contraction joints in the fields of reinforced concrete uh, have caused problems with seasonal uh, changes causing hairline cracking in the reinforced concrete, which then allows water to find its way in. Um, so I'm showing you a slide here. This is probably from the early 90s, and you can see how extensive some of the concrete patching was in the early 90s. This is a patch that we did uh, just a few years ago in 2018 to the bottom corner of uh, the terrace, uh, the pottery terrace. Um, and a big concern for us now uh, is the corner of the master bedroom terrace, the southwest corner, which I have circled in blue. Um, again, because of issues of expansion and contraction and just failure of the concrete over time, this corner needs some special attention um, and it'll be integrated into uh, this $3 million program over the next couple of years. It'll be a complicated scaffolding dilemma. We'll probably have to boom out some scaffold and counterbalance it so it hangs out over the waterfall. Um, but this repair will be particularly challenging for us as part of this upcoming scheme. Uh, I show you this slide uh, just to reiterate how much flat surface is exposed to snow and rain at Falling Water. Kind of all of the darker areas you're seeing are the flat roofs over roof slabs. And then, of course, too, some of the terraces serve as roofs uh, for interior spaces below. So those also have waterproofing underneath them. Originally, uh, this is a construction photo from 1937. All of those roofing and terrace spaces were treated uh, with just uh, um, hot asphalt um, impregnated building felts. So they would lay down the building felts and then cover them in hot asphalt. And I think this little campfire uh, over here at the far side of the stream is probably where they were heating up the asphalt uh, to cover over the building felts. Um, but that system, uh, from the very beginning, there were roof leaks everywhere, I think over a dozen when the house was initially finished. So all of that original system was replaced in the 1980s. And then again, in the early 2000s, and I'm showing you the systems that were used uh, in the early 2000s replacement. Um, two different systems. The top one is for the roof slabs that are solid concrete, and the one on the right is for uh, the waterproofing underneath the flagstones of the terraces. And here's just an installation of that system on one of the concrete roof slabs, kind of in sequence. And then here's a view what's what's underneath the, the flagstones of the terraces, and then this would be covered over with the terrace stones. And as Scott was showing you, uh, on the, the bridge that goes over the driveway, um, kind of that new system that we'll be installing um, holistically uh, on all of the flat roofs and terraces across falling water. 
So all of those 2000 systems will begin updated with 2020 systems. And then finally, I'm gonna fast forward here because I think we're out of time, uh, addressing the, the steel of the window and door sashes. Um, the high humidity, moisture of the environment constantly attacks the steel of the window and door sashes, which eventually leads to corrosion and rust. Uh, so cyclically, we have to peel the, the, strip the paint off, repair those areas of corrosion, sometimes even to the extent of having to replace sections of steel and then apply new paint system. Uh, and sometimes this requires some tricky scaffolding to get to hard to reach places on the exterior of the house. But over the next three years, three to five years, we'll be addressing these systems, the stone masonry, the reinforced concrete, all of the waterproofing on the roofs and terraces and preservation of the steel window and door sash to the tune of a $3 million comprehensive uh, campaign. Um, so to, to all of our friends, thank you uh, for those of you that have already contributed to support this program. Um, and if you're interested in supporting, you can go to fallingwater.org uh, and visit our um, donate page to contribute to this program. We're just a few hundred thousand short of that $3 million goal. So we appreciate everyone's support. And if you visit Falling Water over the coming years, you're gonna to continue to see lots of preservation activity going on. And as Scott mentioned, this is important to us, not just from a preservation standpoint, but from an educational standpoint. Um, our visitors really engage in the story of how we care and steward this property through the ongoing preservation work that we do. Uh, and because the construction was so revolutionary uh, when the house was built, we're an experimental place for preservation philosophy and preservation technology. So we're really kind of paving the way with, with new ways and new systems of doing repairs. So it's an exciting time for us. Um, it'll be a lot of work over the next couple of years, but it'll ready falling water um, for the next generations. And with that, Nicole, I think we can take a couple questions. You, Justin. Um, since we're over, um, any questions that aren't answered live, um, we can send you emails to address specifics. Um, and there will be a recording, a link to the recording sent out to everyone after the presentation. Um, so the first question is in regard to uh, Bear Runs, the water flip beneath the house that was controlled during the, the bolster work. Is there a bypass that exists to reroute the water? And um, also, how did they originally hold back Bear Run when they built Falling Water? There's an on-off switch for the stream. So every morning we turn it on and at the end of the day we turn it off. Um, no, the sandbags, right, Scott? Yeah. Even historically, it was done with sandbags. Yeah. So they would just build up the sandbags to control the flow and divert the stream. Uh, where did all the debris from the bridge actually go? Uh, for the current project, it was removed from the site by the contractor. So it was there was no um, debris left here. We didn't we didn't dump anything on site. Portions of it were used um, for testing, obviously core samples yeah. were taken, which we retained, and then we do always retrain, retain some portion of the original fabric uh, as part of an architectural fragments collection. I think a lot of people probably have this question, what waterproofing membrane was used for the oh. lights? Uh, it's, it's a layered system, um, C-PLAST, S-I-P-L-A-S-T is the manufacturer and it was the membrane was um, C plus Paradigm. I had actually wrote this down because I thought somebody would ask. Paradigm, P-A-R-A-D-I-E-N-E, 20TS, 20TS. And yeah. that's cemented membrane. So yeah, historically it was just building felt with asphalt. Mm -hmm. And then the 2000s replacement Scott was Again, a multi-layered, triple redundancy, modified bitumen membrane. And then we're going to go to the 2020 technology, which is this SIP blast uh, membrane system. 
that's a nice segue into a big question. Is it hard to marry Wright's original vision with the new technologies in preservation? Well, I'll throw in my answer then Scott can, okay. can also chime in. I mean, I think um, if the technologies, you always run the risk of putting yourself in the mind of the architect in today's time, right? But I mean, he would have used these systems today if they were available to him at the time and he was using the most advanced technology of his time. Um, and, you know, we have a philosophy here that as long as it doesn't affect the original design intent of the architecture, and we go to every extent possible to maintain as much of the material authenticity as we can, then we can supplement the original uh, with, with new technologies to improve the long-term preservation of the building. Scott, anything that you would add on? Well, I just, you know, like you said, putting yourself in the mind of the architect, I always, you know, think what would Wright have done if he had the ability to, to you know, use CAD and use all these different kind of visualization tools to, you know, solve some issues and, um, you know, would he have designed those walls with rubble voids if he could see through them and, you know, I, it's just kind of an interesting um, philosophical question, but um, yeah, I think as long as it's not, um, you know, impacting the the visual quality, I think it's all good. It's all protecting the building if we're using newer technology and in those ways. And I think especially with the roofing membranes, it's going to really help with some um, some water issues that we have been having. Yeah, we, we'd be in trouble if we went back to just asphalt impregnated building faults. Exactly. We'd yeah. be back to the house of 13 buckets getting getting all right. the roof leaks. Okay, I think that's a, probably a good place to wrap it up since we went over in time. I want to thank everyone for attending today. Thanks, everybody. Great, thank you.